current conflicts, trying to understand current conflicts. <coughs> We've looked at the wars in Afghanistan and Syria, and now the conflict in Ukraine and uh, with Russia. Uh, you're in for both a scare and a treat. A treat in the sense that we have three outstanding members of our faculty. Can't think of three better people for you to listen from, to teach us, tell us about what is happening at this moment. Um, I could tell you also it's going to be a scary moment. Uh, but before I say more about that, just, I'll just tell you two other events that are forthcoming that may be of interest to you. They're all open to the public. Uh, on Friday at the University of Massachusetts, the Institute for Holocaust, Genocide, and Memory Studies is putting on an all-day conference on understanding memories of war. It's all day. It's, um, I can't see where this is. It says it's 758 North Pleasant Street. I'm sorry. I, I think it's the Holocaust building. The, the Holocaust. I can't remember the official name. It used to be the Episcopal Church had a building there and they bought it. I see. Yeah, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, 758 North Pleasant Street. Uh, all day uh, from yes. 10, 10 to 11.30, re-examining the Spanish yes. Civil War. Uh, from 11.45 to 1 on Bosnian Art of Cultural Resistance. And from 1.30 to 2.45, Stories from Iraq and Afghanistan. With a very impressive list. I just want to say I have a very strong, scary feeling that we're going to look back at these events of today and the coming days could very well be a turning point in modern history. Things are, seem to me to be out of control in a way that we have not seen maybe since World War II. Um, it's certainly in Europe where uh, the sanctity of borders seems to be in question and the possibility of uh, Russian intervention in another country seems very real beyond just in Crimea. And to address this, to un try to understand what's happening, I've assembled <coughs> um, a panel of three outstanding scholars from our community. Uh, first to speak will be Professor Stephen Jones, from Mount Holyoke College. He's a specialist on, uh, on the Caucasus region, and he's going to talk about the uh, Russian behavior in Georgia, the war in 2008, and draw from that what we can expect uh, about Russian behavior in Ukraine. He will be followed by uh, Professor Sergei Lebov, who teaches here at Amherst College, who studies Russian history and culture. And he's been following events very closely on the ground in Ukraine and in Russia, and will tell us about what actually is going on in Russia, what are the po and Ukraine, what are the politics of this. And he will be followed by Professor Ulyan Taubman, a uh, historian of modern Russia, a specialist on uh, former uh, leader Khrushchev, who's going to speak about U.S.-Russian relations. Um, and I can assure you that, uh, that they will provide us with incredible background on all of this. I've asked them to speak for a, about 15 minutes or a little bit more than that each, so that you will have plenty of time to bring questions, your questions and concerns to them. Uh, again, I want to thank Michael Kenneth for organizing this and uh, also uh, very thankful to be on the panel with uh, such wonderful colleagues, uh, like Bill Townsend and Sergei, who know much more than I do uh, about the Russian situation. Uh, I'm going to be addressing uh, in part the, uh, the ramifications of Crimea on, on the rest of uh, the uh, former republics that used to belong to the Soviet Union and what they are thinking about the events in Crimea. Um, thank you all for coming out on this rainy day, but of course, as Michael said, this is a really rather dramatic event. 
and um, it could have enormous impacts on what happens in Europe in the next decade. Michael was a little unfair giving us 15 minutes each, but I will do my best in trying to um, summarize some of, some of uh, the reactions that we're seeing um, on, on Russia's borders. So, the world according to Putin, which order actually is it? How does he see the world? And uh, this was a speech that he made uh, on March 18th, 2014. It was a speech after which you can see his hands there. He signed uh, the formal incorporation of, uh, of Crimea into the Russian Federation. And it's a very interesting speech. This is only one extract of it, uh, which demonstrates, I think, uh, the more rational truth. It's a bit too loud. Okay. It's hard to judge. How about that? Yeah. Um, so uh, let me just read through it with you, and you'll see that, uh, as I said, this is the more rational Putin at work. If I put it up again, I'll try and keep it down. Uh, after the dissolution of bipolarity on the planet, we no longer have stability. Key international institutions are not getting any stronger. They're sadly degrading. Our Western partners, led by the United States of America, prefer not to be guided by international law and their practical policies, but by the rule of the gun. They have come to believe in their exceptionalism, that they can decide the destinies of the world. They use force against sovereign states, building coalitions based on the principle, if you are not with us, you are against us. To make this aggression look legitimate, they force the necessary resolutions from international organizations, and if this does not work, they simply ignore the UN Security Council and the UN overall. not totally inaccurate. In other words, what Putin is saying is that it's not the revisionism, if you like, of Russia that we should be concerned about. It's the revisionism of Western states and, and in particular, the United States. And that in some sense, the world that he sees is one that has completely revised. Um, the agreements over Yalta in 1945 and the agreements again of 1991. This is a different world and it's a world that in some sense he argues has been inspired uh, by uh, the United States and in some sense Russia is only reacting um, to this environment. So a lot of people have been talking about the Putin doctrine and I think that something <coughs> different is happening in Russian foreign policy uh, around the situation in Ukraine. Um, so if you read the speech, and it's not just Putin's speech, but you look at the antics, for example, in the Russian parliament, and you hear other representatives of the Russian establishment, you can see that some things are, are changing. Uh, maybe not dramatically, because many of these elements of the Putin drop doctrine are present in other states and have been present in Russian foreign policy before. But I think when you put all these elements together, you are getting something like a Putin doctrine that represents uh, a significant shift in foreign policy. And one of these, well, the first one that I mentioned is this renewed emphasis on ethnicity as a, as a basis of territorial claims. And if you, if you read the rest of his speech on, on, of, March, of March 18th, you will see that he talks about, very much about, Crimea being part of Russia. And the reason that it's part of Russia is because, well, for historical reasons, although it is only part of the Russian Empire since 1783, uh, but also because it so happens that 65 to 70 percent of the population living there are ethnically Russian. And this is an issue, that Russia has in some sense the right um, to protect and secure the, the interests of Russian co-ethnics, even if they're not citizens, Russian co-ethnics abroad. Um, secondly, and this has been going on for a long time, not happened, didn't happen only in Crimea, it happened in Moldova, and it happened in, in this, what we might call the separatist regions of Georgia, named Abkhazia and South Ossetia, that part of the strategy also is to prepare the path, if you like, by granting citizenship uh, to Russians living outside Russian borders. Now, this, of course, is not unique. I want to maintain this, that it's, it's not 
something that other states don't do either. I guess the Irish also grant passports to, you know, to American citizens, for example. Uh, but it's these things in combination that I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about that have, that have changed the situation. We call it passportization, and it's done on a massive scale. When Russia decides uh, to grant these passports, uh, it introduced laws that reduce the requirements of Russian citizens living abroad to actually acquire them. It simplifies the procedure and also, also promotes um, uh, the, uh, the giving of passports to Russian citizens. That, of course, gives them uh, the basis uh, for claiming that they are, or at least that they have a right to protect not only co-ethnics, but a right also to protect their citizens abroad. Um, the third part, the third element that comes out of this speech, and which we might call the Putin doctrine, is this idea that we can support self-determination over state sovereignty. Now that's a big issue in international relations. What is it that, that, that uh, justifies um, or generates uh, independence movements and the declaration of independence? Um, but from the arguments of Putin in this speech, uh, it's clear that he sort of goes back on his rejection of Kosovo and now saying that, um, that self-determination, a unilateral self-determination, uh, um, uh, has priority uh, over state sovereignty. Uh, fourthly, the right to protect Russians anywhere abroad in any state. Now that, again, is something that you would expect to see. Many other states would make the same claim, you know, that they have a right to protect their citizens abroad. It's often written in the first page of your passport, and my British passport, that's the case. Anyway. Um, but Putin sort of adds this part with any means, and I actually quote uh, a little from a, an interview that he gave on March the 4th, where he says, if we see such uncontrolled crime spreading to the eastern regions of the country, he's talking, of course, about Ukraine, and if the people ask us for help, while we already have the official request from the legitimate president, Yanukovych, we retain the right to use all available means to protect those people. When other states claim that they can protect their citizens abroad, uh, it's not necessarily with any means. It seems to have gone a step further in that respect. And the fifth part of this is the legitimacy of annexation, which again is a tremendous challenge to the post-World post -World War II order that, that we have become accustomed to. Sorry, I've the wrong way. So, when it comes to uh, how long have I got, Michael? Keep going. Yeah. I'll tell you. Uh, so um, when it comes to precedence, you know, where where does this invasion of Crimea fit in uh, in terms of uh, Russian foreign policy that we've seen in the 20th century? And uh, you know, I was thinking about um, Eastern Europe. Maybe Hungary 1956, Czechoslovakia 1968, maybe Afghanistan 1979. And I eventually came to the conclusion that we have to actually limit those, eliminate those as, um, as precedents, if you like, for what Russia is doing in the Crimea. I think the precedent more is something like Moldova in 1993 when Russia um, moved its army, or its army actually was already present there, the 14th Army in Moldova, and essentially uh, occupied this strip of land on the Moldovan border, and it became um, de facto a territory under Russian control. This was in 92, 93. And then, of course, again, in Georgia, 2008, we see a similar uh, actions when Russia again claims that it is protecting Russian citizens because it has already passportized, if you like, many of the, um, of the minorities in Georgia, the Abkhazians and the South Ossetians, given them citizenship and gives them this legitimate claim, as Russia sees it at least, uh, to move in and protect their rights if, as Russia says, they are threatened by the majority population, namely the Georgians. 
And the reason that I, I want to distinguish Moldova and Georgia from the rest uh, is because I think of these, these three things that are going on, that this, this new trinity, if you like, of Russian policy is, it's about, it, it's something very different from what we see in Eastern Europe um, uh, after World War II, where it's about strategic plays during the Cold War. Um, whereas when we look at uh, Moldova and Georgia, what we see, I think, are uh, revanchism, that is mainly a claim for lost territories that belong to Russia. Now, you couldn't claim that about Hungary or Czechoslovakia, but you can claim it about bordering states that formerly were part either of the Russian Empire or the Soviet Union. Uh, irredentism, that is, because you have co-ethnics living abroad, there is some quality that naturally binds them to your state. That's what we call irredentism, and this was certainly a justification of, of Putin's uh, actions in Crimea, that there was this natural union, that we had to reunite the uh, Crimean Russian population with Russia. And thirdly, um, and I'd actually put quasi irredentism in there, because there's an interesting difference with Georgia, in the sense that when Russia was thinking about bringing the separatist areas of Abkhazia and South Ossetia under Russian influence, it couldn't say, actually, that they were co-ethnics. Because they're not. They are Abkhazians and South Ossetians, they're different ethnic groups. But it could say, firstly, that they were Russian citizens. And secondly, it could say that they were Russian speakers. And thirdly, it could say, they, they historically, uh, that they, were, you know, they belonged to uh, the, the greater Russian state. Um, and again, you know, it's these three elements, I think, and revisionism in the sense that uh, what Putin is doing here is changing what we accepted, as Michael pointed out earlier on, as the status quo, that is the observance of the inviolability of, of borders as they developed after 1945. So these three elements together suggest, I think, that moving in a different direction. And uh, it's backed by a different philosophy, a different foreign policy uh, than, say, the precedents that are often recalled, um, that is, uh, the invasion of Hungary and Czechoslovakia in 56 and 68. This is something really quite different. Okay, I, I know I'm probably running out of time, so I've got two or three other slides and I'm not going to be able to get to them. But let me just think about the, why I'm connecting uh, Georgia and the Crimea and what perhaps unites uh, these two cases. The picture there is actually one of, uh, um, taken in South Ossetia, this is the northern part of Georgia, one of the, the, the small entities that separated itself from Georgia, and you can see there it says Nash President, our president, namely Putin. Um, um, and I think what unites them is that, you know, there's, there's, there are plenty of context here in terms of why Russia acted the way that it did. There's a global context, and Bill, I guess, is going to talk about the, the global context. There is a regional context. There's a domestic context in Ukraine or in Georgia. And then there's a domestic context in Russia, too. Um, but when we, when we look at that first point, strategic threat perceptions, I think that as far as Russia is concerned, what was happening in Ukraine and what was happening in Georgia were one and the same in the sense that he saw growing Western influence represented by West, the growth of Western NGOs, uh, the, uh, the growing influence of the European Union, uh, the possibility, if you like, of, of uh, some greater uh, cooperation with NATO, and all these, these sorts of things for, for Putin clearly were, it wasn't just a, a, a question of, um, well, it was a question really of one of the questions, let's say, is the sense that the West was pressing on Russia's borders and it was using 
these states like Georgia and Ukraine to do so. Uh, again, both with Crimea and, and with Georgia. Ideological polarization, we had the Rose Revolution in 2003, uh, we had the Orange Revolution in 2004, Elements which suggested that both Georgia and Ukraine again were moving away from the strategic uh, influence of Russia. There is, of course, the issue of oil and gas. Uh, there's a very strategic oil pipeline that runs through the Caucasus and runs through, runs through Georgia. And there are similar issues, of course, in Ukraine in terms of the transit of oil and gas through that region. So there are economic issues here to be considered uh, that. Um, that uh, that, um, that suggests similarities between uh, the two regions. Domestic disunity, again, you know, Georgia at that time really not a consolidated state, um, very polarized state, the same situation in Ukraine. These events happen after, some people might call it a revolution, uh, in, in 2014 in, in Kiev. Um, you know, these are situations, obviously, which Russia uh, can take advantage of. And timing is very important, of course, uh, as we can see, because Ukraine is completely um, incapable right now of, of mounting any resistance to Russia. Uh, limited power of international community, and you know, maybe Bill will talk about this one. Um, you know, Putin's looking at this and he's saying, well, you know, well, what's going to happen? Who's going to do anything? What's going to, you know, is there going to be seen? Moldova, uh, we've seen now Crimea. Would it be Kazakhstan, northern Kazakhstan, next, where there's a 50% um, Russian population? So, you know, the, 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 one of the important parts of this is the potential and possibilities that Russia has in this particular post imperial geographical context where it has these major Russian diasporas on its borders and the memorandum. So the question then is what happened? Why did Russian leadership, and um, I don't think it's just Putin alone, but probably a number of people in the Russian leadership, why did they decide to make this dramatic um, decision? And why did they decide to take, um, or to tolerate all the pain that obviously will be inflicted on the Russian economy and very likely on the Russian political and economic elite um, as a result of this action. And what I'm going to tell you, I think, is a uh, somewhat an idiosyncratic uh, a vision. Um, and there are certainly other factors, but in my view, this is the most important factor that contributed uh, to this decision and to the massive crisis that we have um, in Europe now. So to understand this factor, we need to go back to uh, the year 2011. In the fall of 2011, uh, Vladimir Putin and Dmitry Medvedev, both here, announced that um, they're going to switch places. Medvedev, who was a placeholder for Putin as the president of the Russian Federation, announced that he's not going to stand for re-election and that uh, uh, Putin will be uh, presenting his candid candidacy um, for the presidential uh, poll um, in uh, late fall of that year. This was actually nothing new in Russian politics, but for a number of reasons, this time the public reaction was very unusual. And what you have throughout the fall and the early winter of 1911 is massive protests in Moscow, um, known as the December protests mostly. And we have sometimes up to 100,000 people coming to the streets of Moscow and uh, articulating their displeasure with uh, this decision. Most people were just frankly um, insulted by the ease with which these two characters uh, jungled with the uh, uh, office of the president and the elections. Um, this was a very genuine uh, feeling, and it was what, mostly a feeling shared by urban middle class, mostly young, although not, not, not exclusively, people in uh, cities like Moscow, uh, uh, St. Petersburg, Ekaterinburg, and others. Um, this is a moment, a, a really a pivotal moment, because essentially for the first time in Putin's term, he was facing very demographically significant protests on the streets of his own capital. Right? 
These protests were also significant because they increasingly involved most of the Russian urban elite. They were supported, at least tacitly, by some segments of the political sector, including the so-called systemic liberals. And these are mostly guys who serve in Putin's government, but they profess to be economic liberals, and they generally would like to live in Europe, but they just happen to live in Russia. Um, and so the danger for Putin's regime was actually unprecedented. Nothing like that happened before. Right? So we might want to consider what were his options. And the traditional response of Putin's long rule, and he's been in power for a very long time now, um, over a decade, or, you know, we are closer to 15 years now, uh, was to pour money, to pour financial resources into those segments of uh, the population where the trouble is brewing. Whether it be the retirees, uh, the beneficiaries of, this, of the Russian state pension system, whether it be the military, whether it be um, uh, the urban professionals, uh, the solution to social problems in Putin's Russia was always to pour money, to pour economic resources into those sectors. During the 1990s, the U.S. set out to try to help uh, we saw it that way, and a lot of Russians did too at the time, Russia to move toward greater democracy at home and a more market-oriented economic system. In that effort, we had uh, NGOs in uh, the Soviet Union, and we tried in other ways to help them. It didn't work. I don't think it was primarily our fault, but we gave them the advice, and many of the Russians looked at it afterwards and said, not only that we given them poor advice, but that we meant to give them poor advice because what we were out to do was to weaken their economy so that we could eventually dictate to them. NATO expansion, first to Poland, Hungary, and Czechoslovakia, then to Romania and Bulgaria, ultimately to the three Baltic republics which had been uh, republics of the former, of the Soviet Union. And then there was talk, talk only, it never came to that, who knows what would have happened, about NATO, possible NATO membership for Georgia and Ukraine. And here I'm going to quote from George Kennan himself. It's actually Thomas Friedman who quoted him the other day in the New York Times, speaking in 1998, at the time when NATO extended its expansion furthest. I think it is the beginning of a new Cold War, Kennan said to me, to Friedman. I think the Russians will gradually react quite adversely and it will affect their policies. I think it is a tragic mistake. There was no reason for this whatsoever. Actually, there were reasons. Uh, you may consider them good reasons or bad reasons. We can talk about them later if you wish. There was no reason for this whatsoever. No one was threatening anyone else. This expansion would make the founding fathers of this country turn over in their graves. We have signed up to protect a whole series of countries even though we have neither the resources nor the intention to do so in any serious way. NATO expansion was simply a lighthearted action by a Senate that has no real interest in foreign affairs. Then there was Yugoslavia. It is indeed the case that we bombed Belgrade and other parts of Serbia, uh, and that as a result of, in part of our policy of pressure on Serbia, Kosovo was able to break away to the point where it is now basically independent, although I don't know whether technically uh, it, it actually is. Uh, Putin compares this to Crimea and says, what's the difference? You did it there, we're doing it here. Um, Iraq, Putin talks about Iraq. I suspect we don't have to uh, talk about Iraq in this room tonight. Libya, it's quite true. There was a UN resolution which authorized limited use of force to protect uh, the Libyan people who were being bombed by Gaddafi's planes, and, and who, Gaddafi who threatened to obliterate uh, a city or two. And Ukraine itself. Russia pressured Ukraine to join the Eurasian Union. The East European Union pressured Ukraine to develop a relationship with Europe. Was it either or? Putin seems to think so. Uh, and one more thing that Putin is interestingly correct about, and that is, you've probably heard this, that after 9-11, Putin was the first foreign president to call President George W. Bush 
and offer his sympathy and cooperation. And that extended to facilitating the use of bases for the American military in Central Asia to help supply American troops in Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, this is what he said was not reciprocated by the United States later on. So this is a pretty impressive list. And I think anybody who talks about this has to consider, as I say, whether Putin wasn't right about many of, things, of these things. And one of the problems with our debate about this is that this kind of consideration doesn't appear very often. It appeared in the column by Jack Matlock, who was the American ambassador to Russia uh, in the, uh, under Gorbachev, the late Gorbachev years. It appears in Stephen Cohen's pieces in The Nation. It doesn't generally appear, and it seems to me you can't do justice to this situation without recognizing this and then wrestling it, wrestling with it, which is what I'm about to do. Okay, but my first point is that Putin has indeed been building an authoritarian state. Uh, Sergei Glebov is the second person whom I've heard use the word fascist about it. Uh, last week, a Amherst graduate class of 1981 who uh, is in charge of European and Eurasian affairs at the Center for International and Strategic Studies in Washington used the same phrase. And he mentioned the fact that Sergei uh, confirmed tonight at dinner that a man named Andranik Migranyan, who is a sort of survivor in Soviet and Russian politics, and who has a way of sort of expressing views uh, that fit with those of the leaders with whom he remains in good odor, even though he switches eventually to the next leader and remains in good odor with that one, published in an interview the view that Hitler was really quite fine until 1939. And am I right, Sergei, that there was actually a comparison with, to yeah. Putin in this? In other words, that was, until 39, what Hitler was doing was defensible in some sense. After that, of course, uh, it wasn't, yeah, it wasn't before. But what does this mean? My wife, who teaches Russian or taught Russian literature for many years at Amherst, immediately pointed out that we have to ask the question, what is Migranyan trying to do? Is he trying to cultivate Putin, whom he thinks will actually appreciate this? Uh, is he trying accurately to describe the situation? Could it be that he's trying to warn the West uh, rather than not warn the West? Uh, we don't know, but I suspect it probably wasn't the latter. Now let's look more, a little bit more closely at Putin in Crimea and Putin in Ukraine. Putin has been saying, you know, if you read the paper, that Ukraine, that Russians especially in Ukraine and especially in eastern Ukraine and in Crimea before uh, it was liberated to rejoin Russia, have been threatened by a relatively small clique of West Ukrainian-based fascists. It's, it's ominous now. That Fascism is becoming something that is used in both sides of this debate. Fascist, anti-Semites, uh, neo-Nazis. Well, uh, there were some people like this involved. Uh, they were not the main force of the demonstrations in Maidan in Kiev. When the fighting began, uh, some of these people brought clubs, <coughs> used them and burned tires. Uh, but it's not my impression uh, from what I've read, which is some, but not as much as I would like, that these people were about to uh, run loose in eastern Ukraine or Crimea, and that they were threatening, or likely to threaten, the Russians who formed 60 to 65 percent of the people in Crimea. Putin also says that the civil defense, the self-defense forces, whom we saw in, many of whom we saw in Crimea, and now we're seeing acting again in eastern Ukraine, and who wore uniforms uh, that looked like Russian uniforms, except they didn't have insignias of the Russian army on them, although they did travel around in cars that had Russian license plates. <laughs> he says that these were self-defense forces and not Russian troops. Some of them admitted that they were Russian troops. When he was asked, well, how come they're wearing Russian uniforms? And he said, well, you can buy uniforms of the Russian army in almost any store in, in the former Soviet Union. I think it's also interesting that if you look closely at the pictures of them, you see that they did not tear 
their insignias off these uniforms at the last minute as if this was a decision that Russia had made at the last minute to send these people in. And if they didn't, then probably somebody made the decision quite a while ago to buy 10 or 20,000 Russian uniforms without insignias. So there's a lot of advanced planning here on the part of those who sent these people in. In other words, um, whatever you think of the points Putin makes about the United States, when he talks about what's happening in Ukraine, it is a lot of lies and a lot of propaganda. Of course, not the only one in the world who engages in lies and propaganda, but this is a pretty heavy diet that he has been peddling uh, as if it were the truth. At the, the final point I want to make, um, or not quite the final one, um, has, is the biggest but of all. And this goes back to annexing the territory of another state. Um, Stephen Jones mentioned that. Sergei Glebov mentioned that. They both mentioned that this principle has been at the cornerstone of the post-World War II era. Now you may say, well, the United States acted without a UN resolution. That was not a good thing to do. But it wasn't quite the same thing as a sort of cornerstone of stability in the international order based on non-violation of territorial integrity and non-annexation of another country's territory. And yet, that is what has happened already in Crimea, and if it happens in eastern Ukraine, this is an earthquake, uh, an earthquake in international relations. And from, even if one could understand Putin's point of view and say everything he's doing is logical in his terms, from the point of view of the international order and keeping the peace, one mustn't do this, because when this happens, then all hell can break loose. Uh, the cornerstone is gone, and anything goes. Um, what else do they want to say? Time to finish. Uh, good. <laughs> Thank you. I, I am just about finished. Two more things. Um, one about what might happen now to save the situation, but before that, I also have the feeling about Putin that he is so now so angry and so convinced that the West is out to get him, as you can tell from his speech, that you know when, when somebody like Obama comes along and tries a reset of the relationship and reaches out to Putin, I fear that Putin is seeing this as either a trick of some sort or a sign of American weakness or of Obama's weakness. I hate to say that because it plays into the hands of right-wing Republicans who say that's precisely what's going on and therefore Obama is to blame for all of this like everything else, which of course is not. Uh, but then when or if he, he takes over Crimea and if he goes beyond that and then if there is a much more severe reaction on the part of the United States and the West, then I think Putin's simply going to say, see, I told you so. They were out to get us. So we lose either way. A kind of double whammy. Well, this is a very dangerous situation. What might be done? I'm not going to talk about sanctions. I'm not going to talk about whether the Germans will go along with sanctions given their big stake in uh, trade and resources from, so from, from Russia. I'm just thinking about what might uh, be a kind of temporary solution to this. It, and this has been, it's not my idea, it's been in the press. It would be some sort of arrangement in which uh, Ukraine adopted a, a kind of federal system which gave greater autonomy to the eastern provinces, but not so much as to make them creatures of Russia because Ukraine wouldn't tolerate that or would try not to tolerate it. And if it happened, then it would be as if Putin had, in effect, gotten what he wanted by the tactics he has adopted. And in the second part of it would be that Ukraine would be declared to be neutral, uh, like Austria. Uh, or it would be like Finland, which has not declared, been declared to be neutral, but declared itself, in effect, to be neutral. Uh, one could conceivably imagine this happening. If it happened, it would mean that Ukraine would not join NATO. Conceivably, these two things could happen uh, under some sort of, some sort of agree agreement brokered by uh, the United States with Russia signing on if Putin is not bound and determined to go farther into 
first into eastern Ukraine and then perhaps into those other areas where there are such sizable Russian populations in other former Soviet republics. Uh, will this happen? I don't know. We'll get some glimpse of this uh, on Thursday when talks are supposed to begin involving uh, Russia, the United States, and the current Ukrainian government, which Putin has declared to be illegitimate. Uh, the other thing to watch for is that if we get through to, is it May 25th? I think that's the date of the Ukrainian elections. If we get through to that point and Ukraine has an election and produces a president uh, who is arguably legitimate and recognized by the world as legitimate, uh, then it's going to be much harder for Russia, I think, to run roughshod uh, as it can still do today. Thank you. Thank you. Eastern Ukraine is the next part to be annexed into Russia. Do you want to make that argument? That's what I think. Well, I should footnote that and say that I'm a historian. I predict the past, not the future. <laughs> it's so much better than you always win. Um, but I think that there is no incentive to de-escalate the conflict whatsoever. Um, because there clearly will be no military response from any important actor in the area. Because what we saw yesterday and today is the inability of the central government in Kyiv to mount what they called an anti-terrorist operation against the separatists in Donetsk, Lugansk, and other cities uh, of Eastern Ukraine. Um, we heard a lot, and this is an important factor here, we heard a lot um, of opinions in the West that these separatists are not representative of the larger segments of the population. I think there is a problem with this argument, partly because what we see on the ground is that certainly the local police in the <coughs> Ukraine is siding with the separatists, and it's a sign of a degree of popular support for them. Um, but from the point of view of incentive and backlash of what Putin can gain and lose, I think he can gain a lot of domestic political mobilization. He can get, gain significant demographic Russian-speaking resources in Eastern Ukraine. Uh, he can gain the industrial hub of, of Donbass, uh, where a lot of the former Soviet military industrial complex enterprises are located. And what's on the losing side? Um, well, maybe the European Union will say, we're not going to give you visas. Um, well, they don't get visas anyway. Um, there is, you know, for, for, the, for the past 10 years, Russians were asking for visa-free travel with the European Union. They never got it. Uh, the United States, well, what kinds of sanctions the United States can impose? Targeting individuals, but they don't keep properties in the United States, mostly in Europe, and they have developed wonderful ways of hiding their properties from any kind of state. Um, and we have seen so far the sanctions, target, targeted sanctions so far haven't been very successful. So I'm on the pessimistic side.